thanks for coming. I didn't think I would be climbing over people to get through the room. <laughs> Somebody must have started the vicious rumor that Taylor Swift was coming here today, not me. <laughs> she will be around Dublin. Someone always dodgy is singing in Dublin when I'm here. The last time I was in Google, it was Justin Bieber. <laughs> so I don't know who's booking this schedule. Um, I do totally hate public speaking, and I always have done, and I know that sounds crazy. Um, my nickname in university was always Shaken Stevens. Uh, I don't know if you've had it when you hold a bit of paper, something like this, and it's in your hand and you're presenting, and you're like, why is it shaking? <laughs> oh, no, and you're looking around. For me, it actually went through my body so much that I became like an Irish salsa dancer. It was going absolutely <laughs> everywhere. And you'll see it happens now. Can you see it shaking? Can't control it, so you just don't do it. That was one of the first things I learned not to do pretty quickly. And for this predicament that I find myself in, I blame Americans. I don't know if you've been there or noticed this, but they're a lot more positive than Irish people. And they will support you with anything, no matter how bad the plan sounds. You could be like, I'm going to give up my job and sell inflatable penguins on the internet. They'll be like, you should do that, man. That could be great. <laughs> Sometimes you just miss Irish people to tell you that's a horrible plan. Get those penguins down off eBay. You're bringing shame to the family. They would tell you very quickly that it's not a good idea to do your time. I, literally, I was so bad in the Shaken Stevens days that when I went to university, originally in IT talent and then later in UCD, but IT talent, people in other classes knew I was so bad that it was worth coming to see me. <laughs> That's a very Irish thing. They're like, this is going to be terrible. Let's go see it. And I'd be there and I'd be looking around. I'm like, who are those extra people down the back? Like, they came to see you go to pieces. And I was like, oh, man. And it, it kind of got the better of me all through my existence. And it does sound like the worst plan ever, what I did in the end, was to do stand-up comedy intensively for a full year to try and get over a fear of public speaking. But I loved Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know if you know him as a writer. And I loved Tim Ferriss. And I loved A.J. Jacobs. And I loved anyone who wrote about the 80-20 principle. Basically, all authors that had said you could shortcut uh, learning processes. There was a way to do things quickly. Um, and that people who had mastery in a certain topic had usually clocked up about 10,000 hours doing it. So one thing, you could shortcut it to a certain level, but then if you wanted to be a true master, who would that be and what would they do? So that was Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours that if you looked at Bill Gates or you looked at the Beatles or you looked at anyone who had huge success in one area, they usually hit that 10,000 hours. So I was like, well, who's better at this than anyone in the world on public speaking? Surely it's comedians. Like, they're up there doing this in the worst of circumstances every night, where people might be coming in off the street after having a horrible day, depressed, lost their job, drinking alcohol, close their arms, sit there and go, make me laugh. <laughs> and you're like, surely night after night. And it, it turns out comedians, on average, the ones that are dedicating themselves to it, put about four hours a day between actually being on stage and crafting the content to get on stage. And usually, they estimate it takes about seven years to make an income full-time from stand-up comedy, which is roughly about those 10,000 hours. And I didn't come across any of this voluntarily. A friend of mine tragically had a spinal cord injury, fell from a third-story balcony, and doctors told him he'd never walk again. And he didn't want to accept that. And his insurance company cut him off and wouldn't fund his recovery attempts. And all my American friends were super positive. They're like, no, we're going to get him through this. We're going to do fundraisers. We're going to get the money. And it kind of rubbed off on me a bit. And I was like, well, maybe I can do something as well. And I said, well, why don't we do a charity show? I know this comedian. Maybe I can get him to headline it. He just happens to be my next door neighbor at the time. Maybe he'll do it. And I went to my friend Arash, and I said, we should do this. And he's like, oh, man, that's great. You're going to be the host, right? You're going to host it? I was like, oh, no. <laughs> he did not know what all my Irish friends knew and all those extra people in the back of the room in IT telling you that I was not very good at that kind of carry on. But it gave me an kind of a, a reason to realize the ridiculousness of the fear I had. And it gave me a belief that maybe you could overcome it. And I think I've learned the hard way after all this that you never really overcome a fear of public speaking. And I think so many people get sold on the belief that you will overcome it. Take this 10-step program. Take this class. Do this weekend. You can overcome it. And everyone I met never really overcame that fear. They just learned to manage it. And that's exactly what happened to me over time. So I started talking to comedians. I said, right. I would have described public speaking as a crippling fear. It was like my friend sitting there in a wheelchair looking at me saying, you're going to host this thing. You can't even consider using that word in that realm anymore. So I'm like, it's just, look at what you're going through. I'm afraid of speaking. That just makes no sense. And especially when you break down the term public speaking, 
Like Irish people hate public speaking, but imagine going to Irish, Irish people love speaking. <laughs> we love speaking, we just hate public speaking. It makes no sense, you're like, do you like speaking, do you? Oh yeah, Have, do you ever do it in public? You talk to people, you do, oh I do, yeah. What about public speaking? Oh no, no, no. Because <laughs> it has this weird, very weird thing when you put these things together. So I was like, right, time has come to try at least and get over this or manage it. I wanted to do this charity event. So I talked to all the comedians I could, I did as much research as I possibly could. I really dived into this and went way down a rabbit hole. Did the charity show. It went really well. One of the main comics it it went so well that he asked me to open for him at a comedy club, the main comedy club in San Francisco. And I was like, should I tell him? I have no idea what I'm doing. No. So I did it. And that scared the life out of me. And I did it again, and I did it again. And I was very much influenced by an author called A.J. Jacobs. I don't know if you've read any of his work. I love him. He goes into topics in te uh, intensively for one year. So he was the guy who wrote The Year of Living Biblically. Have you ever read it where he followed the rules of the Bible to the letter of the law, even though he was Jewish? <laughs> he took it extremely seriously. At one stage, he was in New York in Times Square throwing rocks at adulterers. <laughs> it's a really, really good book. So I was like, right, intensively for a year, stand-up comedy. I can't tell any of my fr Irish friends this plan because they're not going to support it. They're not like the American ones. They're going to be like, what are you doing? You had your master's degree, you're not using it, you're going to be a comedian with no intention of being a comedian. This just makes no sense long term, but I did it anyway. And it turns out it's quite hard to clock up stage time if people know you don't know what you're doing. So I had to make it look like I'd been around doing comedy for a while. And nobody in America could pronounce my last name, which is Nihil, is a bit unusual even in Ireland. So they kept calling me Irish Dave. So I was like, there's a good stage name that sounds horrendous all at the same time, Irish Dave. So I had to get Irish Dave a website make it look like he'd been around for a while, a very professional, and a Facebook page. And at the time, mildly controversial, but you could go on fiverr.com and buy likes. So Irish Day was pretty popular there for a while. <laughs> Mostly in India. That would have been a real red flag for me, but Americans, they seemed okay with it. <laughs> Even the concept, I was like, why would Irish Dave be big in Ireland for doing comedy? That's the worst stage name ever. That's like a guy called American Frank touring America. Like, why, what's the American part for? Anyway, nobody questioned it. So this got a little bit out of control, and it ended up, this is at the end of a full year, and the Mott is a storytelling competition in the US. It's true stories told live with no notes. And this is the biggest competition final they do anywhere in the world. It's in San Francisco, and there's 1,400 people in the audience, and that little ant on stage about to lay an egg is me. And if you came up and hugged me after that, you'd felt like you just hugged someone who got out of the shower. <laughs> not good, not sexy, not anything like that. But if you had seen me speaking, you would have thought I looked pretty comfortable with what I was doing. I didn't have butterflies in my chest. I had pigeons. It was, it was big and bad and it was messy, but other people couldn't tell. So at this stage, I'd learned to figure out a way that comedians knew backwards and sideways of how to manage that public speaking fear, how to get to a point where you know it's going to go well. It's just a matter of how well it's going to go. And that puts you quite at ease. And it was just all these things that comedians knew and learned the hard way and clocking up those 10,000 hours that the average person, even people who taught public speaking, didn't seem to have a clue about. I was like, it's kind of crazy that you're ignoring the one group of people who are doing this the most, especially in the world of business, where most people kind of need it. No offense. Have you been to a conference lately where you're like, your first question is like, not will I sit near the stage? It's like, where's the plug? Where's the nearest plug? Where am I going to plug in my laptop? Where am I going to plug in my devices? Because this is going to be boring and I'm going to need them. But we actually go in there with the bar on public speaking is so low. It's amazing. Like really, just a couple of little things and you really stand out quite fast. So today is just about taking you through a bunch of those things. This day was just about me telling a story and some pretty crazy things happened just because of telling that story, uh, a story very unique to me. And I'll tell you what happened at the end of that. But I really went down this rabbit hole. I started looking at comedians and I'm like, well, I wonder if business speakers are doing the same things as comedians. Maybe they just don't know it or they aren't aware of the correlation. So I started breaking down TED Talks. Uh, this is one of my favorite speakers, Seth Godin. He's so funny that even Ted described his talks as hilarious. But then it's like, well, how hilarious is he actually? And can we measure this? And it turns out there's a metric that comedians use and are very aware of called laughs per minute. How many times you make someone laugh per minute? And it turns out he's making people on average laugh about 3.4 times per minute. And then, OK, what does that metric mean, though? Give me some level of comparison. These are the three funniest movies in history. Airplane, The Hangover, and The Naked Gun. Some guy talking about marketing will make you laugh more on a sheer reputation basis per minute than the funniest movies of all time. 
So think about that, like a team of the best of the best script writers in Hollywood sat down and got the best creative talent and said, we're going to be funny. And this guy said, I'm going to talk about marketing. And he got more laughs. Now, granted, the movie script is a longer script to it. It has a longer period of time to keep people's attention. And if you're watching The Hangover, you're definitely laughing bigger. But for sheer repetition, for engaging his crowd, and this guy and is, is up there with all the funniest movies of all time. And the nice thing is, if we're trying to produce that, well, how's he doing it? And I should tell you around the stage, if you're watching this or you're in the room, you're writing notes. If you want to be lazy in any way, I have a link at the end I'll give you. Uh, and it links to anything I'm going to mention, any of the things I'm going to mention at all, video-wise, book-wise, writer-wise. And you can download all the tips for free, because I forget a lot of stuff, to be honest, sometimes. 58% from images. So literally, just that last metric alone, sorry, he is just using GIFs, funny things from online, socially proven content. And instead of telling somebody how frustrated he was, he's showing them. I was left so frustrated, it was a bit like this. And then reveal of the image, which creates a little bit of a surprise and nearly always a laugh. I don't know if you've ever seen a presentation where you saw somebody put up something funny, and then they just stand there looking at it, and they're like. <laughs> and you're like, you're a total weirdo. That's all you're thinking at that moment, because they haven't built an element of surprise to it. It's really that this is how I felt. How did you feel? Show me how you felt. And when you show it like that, like a comedian would do a joke where you really hide the reveal until the end of it, you get quite a big reaction. And he wasn't the outlier. So we actually studied all the world's leading TED Talks and correlated them for this measurement of humor. And it turns out every one of the leading, most popular TED Talks in the world are funny. Every one of the top 10 TED Talks are funny. These are all researchers. So Mary Rhodes, Sean Asher, and Ken Robinson, all researchers. Researchers normally not known for being the most exciting, funny people. No offense, researchers. But these are very serious, heavy topics for the most part, apart from Mary Roach's. Have you ever seen that? Talk about female orgasm. I only see one guy nodding his head, smartest man in the room. <laughs> that was very quick. You're like, I knew this was coming. Well done. You're going to be signing books after, not me. <laughs> Stallion. But it's very clear that all these leading talks were actually funny. So if you want to go and you're speaking in these days, there was nearly an expectation for you to have a level of entertainment within the content you were giving people. So how do we reproduce this? Very much 80-20 principle style, which I love. So we're going to focus on the 20% of the things to give you 80% of the results. And this becomes quite clear quite fast in public speaking. So breaking down any topic. You can do it with anything, really, language-wise. Any Brazilians in here today? No, this is the only time in Dominion you're from Brazil. Brazilian Portuguese sounds really complicated, but then you're like, I think they're just taking English words and sticking an E on the end of many of them and making it sound pretty groovy. And I was like, imagine like you were in a meeting and you wanted to get some, some commentary from a manager. You'd be like, give me some Fiji Becky. Fiji Becky, that's a word. And then if you go camping and you're not going to sleep in your duvet or your bed sheets, you're going to need a sleepy baggy. <laughs> I just kept getting better as a... Internet. Internet, thank you. You're going to post things on Facebook, you watch a YouTube. You might play some pingy pongy, kingy kongy, knock out you. You can go to a field, have some wine and cheese, picky nicky. You can do it all. So it just keeps going. I love that language. My personal favorite is when you have a cold and you have some problems breeding, Vicky Vaporobi. God, I love that word. But all of a sudden, something that was complicated, you become, oh, I see a pattern. So all we were doing with this one is, is similar, but without, I love the old Brazilian Portuguese. Sorry about that one. That was what, you were even more happy about it than I was to show. <laughs> you, we didn't even mention the Hedgy Hutchy Chili Peppers, the band. <laughs> I love those a lot. So 80-20 principle, how do we break it down? So what are the world's leading speakers doing? What patterns are we able to teach people very quickly? And what, how can people get really good at p public speaking really fast? Number one, always start with a story, especially if you're trying to be funny. So if you make a joke about someone, you have a huge chance of failure. If you make a joke about you or tell a story about you, it's very easy most of the time to get some sort of positive reaction. If it's embarrassing for me, it's funny for you sick individuals. <laughs> it's very much Irish style on that. I was fundraising for these events for people with spinal cord injuries, and I was sending out emails. And office emails, of course, you normally end them the same way. Kind regards, very formal. I'm dyslexic, and unfortunately, in kind regards, I was mixing up a G and a T. I ended all those emails, kind retards. <laughs> oh yeah, for two whole months. And sometimes I tried to be like office cool and I just dropped kind and I was just going like retards. 
And that day I wanted to just slip into a hole and die and look at you all laughing at my pain. That's kind of how it works. Embarrassing for me, funny for you. So a lot of people in the leading business talks, and I mean the most popular talks of all time, were using a story. They were using a story to be humorous. Thing is, if, if you tell a story and the funny bit is moved to the end, quite consciously, to delay the element of surprise, the same way we would show and we mentioned with the images later, delay that surprise twist until the end. If they laugh, fantastic. It gives a maximum chance of laughing. And if they don't, nothing happens. They don't know you were trying to be funny in any way. So do you ever have that moment where your boss calls you into an office and they're like, oh, sit down. I got a great joke for you. And you're like, oh, God, get me out of here now. <laughs> They've already telegraphed the intention of what they're about to do. So you already have a massive chance of failure. Uh, the other thing on this is pretty key is if you want to create memorable content or information and you want people to be able to tell it back to you, they have to be able to visualize it actually happening. So nobody cares about your story. They care about themselves within your story. So if they can't visualize themselves within your story or you're telling them even a client story in your case when you're pitching in a business context, if you don't put features on that story that their mind can actually visualize, they cannot remember it. They 100% can't remember facts and figures. So you never want to lead any pitch or meeting with facts or figures because your brain just can't remember them. Very, very difficult. They're normally the icing on the cake and not the lead, and a lot of people make that mistake in pitching. But the world's best speakers will always have a story. They're always going to have that funny bit at the end to maximize the chance of something being funny, and they're going to have details into it that you can latch onto or see yourself with it. So a lot of you will probably speak Spanish, do you? Many Spanish speakers, by show of hands, out here, quite a bit. The word in Spanish for to fit is caber. Is that right? Don't trust Irish people speaking Spanish. That's why I'm getting a second opinion. Caber. Yeah. I know that you nodded the first time. You're like, no, it's not. And then you're like, wait, it's just his Irish accent. Yes, it is. He might have said the right thing. If I just try and tell a room of people to remember the word to, uh, for to fit in Spanish, very difficult to remember caber tomorrow. But if we take that and break it up, as another Irishman recommends, Benny Lewis, who speaks 12 languages and wrote a very cool book called Fluent in Three Months. You turn that into a story so your mind can remember it, better yet, so you can visualize it. So we take a taxi cab, New York Street, yellow taxi cab, driving down the street, pulling up outside a Trump Plaza, bit of a scary place to be, but it's pulling up outside there. And a big hairy grizzly bear runs out and tries to get in the taxi. And obviously the hairy grizzly bear doesn't fit in the taxi. The taxi driver's getting a bit emotional about this. He's like, man, what are you doing? Get your hairy ass out of my cab. You're not going to fit in the cab. The bear does not fit in the cab. Cab air is the word for to fit. So you have a whole visual lesson wrapped up there that sounds craziness, but you'll never forget it for the rest of your life. Anyone speak Mandarin Chinese? This might be pushing it, but it's Google. Somebody does for sure. Yourself over there? All right, now we're really testing the Irish people's language skills. I got sent there for work, and I had to try and get a receipt for all my expenses. So my manager was like, the first thing you need to do is get a tax receipt. I was like, oh, I'm going to be so popular in China. They're my first words are like, hello, I would like a tax receipt, please. <laughs> That's all I knew how to say. But luckily for me, the word for I would like in Irish, in, in Chinese, sounds a bit like Irish swear words. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, we're very good with swear words over here in this part of the world. But I would like in Mandarin Chinese is wo shang yao. Correct? Thank you very much. And that sounds to my dirty Irish mind like want to shag you. <laughs> and you might have heard this on the streets of Dublin. Maybe around Copper Face Jacks, I definitely hear it there myself. And the words for tax receipt is fap yow. <laughs> that sounds a bit angry, doesn't it? Something you might hear in the streets of them, come on now, fap yow. <laughs> Cut me off in traffic, fap yow. You'll remember that one. And the word for tax receipt, or sorry, the word for please or not too much trouble, literally, is ma fanny. <laughs> so I literally, I'm sitting in a taxi with this driver, and he goes to pull up, and I'm like, oh, I'm going for this one. Oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end so badly. And he jams on the brakes, turns around, does a kind of awkward pause. And I was just like, want to shake you, fuck you, my fanny? <laughs> <laughs> this guy just hangs me a tax receipt. He was delighted. He was like, oh, shish, yeah, such end, bye bye. And I was like, oh my god, this actually works. <laughs> So I, I was quite proud of myself for learning a bit of uh, Mandarin Chinese rapidly, but you will notice very consciously there isn't a single detail in that story. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that you can latch onto. What does a taxi driver look like? What kind of taxi was it? Where did it place place? What was happening? It'd be extremely hard for you to remind me tomorrow if I asked you, how do you say I would like a tax receipt in Mandarin Chinese? But if I ask you all to say the word for to fit in Spanish together, Caber, big difference. So it's a yellow taxi cab, it's a hairy bear, it's a building, you visualize it and you can picture yourself within that story. 
So if you're public speaking or presenting and you're not delivering information in a way that someone can remember it, you're kind of wasting your time. Unless it's on video like this and you can watch yourself back and wave at yourself and go, look at me on the internet. But most of the time it's not like that. Most of the time you need people to actually resonate and you're trying to convince them of something when you're in a room. So if I told you you could replicate in, how long are we going to be in here, 55 minutes, the world's best talk ever and the most popular talk. So this is Ken Robinson. The talk is called Do Schools Kill Creativity? And I'd just like you to watch it and go, has this anything to do with the topic whatsoever? Does he know where people will laugh in this story? Has he told it before? So just have a watch of that. Is it connected to the topic? Does he know where people are going to laugh? And do you think he's ever told it before? We moved from Stratford to Los Angeles. And I just want to say a word about the transition. Actually, my son uh, didn't want to come. I've got two kids. Uh, he's 21 now and my daughter's 16. He didn't want to come uh, to Los Angeles. He loved it, but he had a girlfriend in England. Uh, this, this was the love of his life. Sarah, he'd known her for a month. <laughs> Mind you, they'd had their fourth anniversary. Because <laughs> it's a long time when you're 16. Anyway, he was really upset on the plane. He said, I'll never find another girl like Sarah. And we were rather pleased about that, frankly. Because <laughs> she was... <laughs> she was... She was the main reason we were leaving the country. But, uh, So he's murdering it there. You like it? It's very, very likable. And I, I have a, a ghost writing business where we write for a lot of the world's kind of leading in, in, uh, influencers and CEOs. And the number one request is, I want to be like Ken Robinson. But Ken Robinson is very much only like Ken Robinson. So you'll notice he has his own style. He has his personality. And you're learning things about his personal life by watching his talks. And his talks are full of little bits like this that are unique to him. You can never copy someone's personality. You can never copy their style, because style is personality. If you copy Chris Rock, do you ever see him doing comedy? I like him a lot. Very funny. But if you copy Chris Rock and you go to your next Google conference, you're getting thrown out. <laughs> right? That style, his personality and style, it can't be copied, but the techniques can. So the technique here is a short form story with the keyword at the end of the story. And do you notice in that one, what do you think is the key funny part to that story when you were watching it? She was the reason we were leaving the country. Very consciously at the end of that. Do you think he's ever told that story before? I see the heads nodding. To me, I can picture him at every Christmas party he's ever been to, just busting out that story. <laughs> do you think it's got anything to do with schools killing creativity? Loosely? Nothing. Not even loosely. And one thing you'll see in all the world's best speakers, they do this literally to the letter of the law. They all do it. Short personal stories about themselves. No story is off topic. As long as it's clean or not offensive in any way, no matter how far removed from your topic you think it is. If you're talking about technology, crazy things do your parents do with technology are perfect. I was trying to get my mother to call me on Skype. And she's like, David, I can't call you on Skype because that computer in there has viruses. And if I use it, I'll get them. <laughs> It's like, brilliant. Now, is that linked to technology? Yes. If we take the wider topic of technology, can I say new users are having sometimes be resistant to change, can resistant to new platforms, can be resistant to new packages? That's a very good example of that that lets the audience picture something within their own life and they latch onto it and actually relate to it. That's way better than you just going, we're in a fundamental moment of change. And they're like, wow, you're so amazing. <laughs> but it just, you just don't learn anything by them fluff statements that a lot of people, the world's best speakers are always just telling little stories about themselves like this that are very, very likable and easy enough to replicate if you try. You can tell any story ever by using the words, I told you that story because. So if you add those words, then everybody's like, there's a reason they told me that story. Now, this can't be an Irish kind of grandmother story. I don't know if you've been subject to them when you're in Ireland, where they're like, oh, it was like when I was going down the road, I met Mary there, and she was out there looking for a couple of cows, and her son was there. He's a bit of an Egypt now, that fella. He went to live in Australia, met a girl there. There's kangaroos everywhere in Australia. Never really liked those myself. I was watching a David Attenborough program, actually on the kangaroos there the other night, and I was wearing my purple shoes at the time. I've lost one of them. I don't even know why I like the color purple. You're just, what the hell are you? <laughs> What are you, has anyone happened that in Ireland? I get those stories all the time, but what are we talking about here? It's obviously in the world of public speaking, you cannot do that. Brevity is levity, you have a very short time period. So we're gonna borrow some techniques from the world of comedy. One of them being joke structure. So comedians live off joke structure, which is the minimum amount of information for you to understand the point of the story. The key part, the key funny part. So in Ken Robinson's example, the punchline is she was the reason we were leaving the country. 
And you could see very visibly that the audience was laughing. And they laughed even a little more than he expected them to laugh. So he shut up and let them laugh. So there's a very powerful line I like called the end of laughter is followed by the height of listening. So the most attention you will have ever is the moment after you make a group of people laugh because they have a dopamine spike and their brain goes, give me more of that. So if you have a very heavy, serious topic, laughter, serious stuff. You get to bring them up and down and up and down as you want as long as you know how to harness this tool effectively. That's why it can be very powerful in the world of public speaking and no topic is too serious for this. Mark Pollock, I'm a, a big fan of his work in Ireland and the charity they have in the run in the dark they've set up. He uh, suffered a spinal cord injury, was paralyzed and went blind. And he wheels out onto a stage in his TED talk. And you can imagine that every single person there is going, oh my God, what a terrible situation. This, it's not relatable to the average person in any way, but he starts off, he's like, ladies and gentlemen, I'm par I've got problems. I'm paralyzed, I'm blind, I'm bald, and I'm from Northern Ireland. <laughs> and they all laugh. Right, straight away, but then the even better line is, listen, I'm not the only one with problems, I bet you guys have too. And they're like, yeah, we do. But now that talk is no longer just about his injury, he's made it applicable to every single person in the room. Humor, serious, relatable to everybody. But it's very key. So if I get up and I'm like, I went to China one time, learned some Chinese, you're like, I don't care. <laughs> but that's your automatically reaction. Whereas if I say something like, being in a new place can be challenging, you're like, yeah, no, I agree with that. Okay, tell me more. Immediately, your mind is like, where's a place that I've been that was challenging? You're already trying to put yourself in the story. So minimum amount of words. Setup is usually three to six sentences and no more. So with Ken Robinson, we knew he was leaving the country. We knew there was a relationship there. We knew there was some change, and that's all we needed to know. So it just forces you to get down to the details. Tagline is anything additional you say at the end of the story, but it normally comes down a bit in the level of laughter. We add what Ken did really, really well. You did lay impact words, key in the world of public speaking. This is when you tell people, I want your attention. Maybe even you should write this down. So the people who are good at this, they can control when you take notes just by changing sentence structure. So if I have a startup and I was pitching a bunch of people and I said to you, we have an 80% growth rate year on year, what do you think I'm most excited about in that sentence? We have an 80% growth rate year on year. You should give us your money. What's exciting about that? 80%, right? That's a big number I'd be excited about. Everything else is pretty changeable in there and wouldn't make a big difference, but 80% is huge. But if I say we have an 80% growth rate year on year, it's very easy for me to keep waffling on. We have an 80% growth rate year on year, and then we hired another team, and we got a Series A investment, and we have these other guys lined up. It's very hard for me to take a mental pause and go, that was important. But if I flip that like Ken Robinson would do, like a comedian would do, like a great speaker would do, the keyword goes to the end. Year on year, we have a growth rate of 80%. Emphasized, volume comes up for the keyword, natural pause, people take out pen and write it down. Very, very important. You guys, especially for your work, you're very metric driven, you're very results driven, you're always going to be showing numbers. If you're really pushing numbers, the number should be at the end of the sentence. Or it's just any old number. Seven, nine, eleven, they're not going to, where did they start? I don't know. Thanks for shouting numbers at me. Year on year, grow rate of 80%, it really takes your attention. In comedy, the funny word, you go out of your way to move it to the end. If you're creating memorable content, very, very key. You want to people to remember what you're talking about. You might have noticed Irish people cannot pronounce the number three. So I wish this would be the rule of four, but it isn't. It is the rule of three. Three is the smallest sequence of elements your mind can recognize as a pattern. So if you want to break a pattern, that's what makes comedy. Comedy is only funny if you create a pattern, you create expectation, and then you shoot in another direction. So like a train coming down the train tracks, you change direction. If I say one, two, your mind automatically expects three. One, two, four. That's comedy. It makes sense, but only retrospectively. It's still a sequence. I was multiplying the numbers. You only knew that after the fact. So it puts me as the speaker or the comedian one step ahead of you. Because you're making the logical sequence, I'm breaking a logical sequence. So comedy is always apples, apples, oranges. The misdirect has to be at the end. If it isn't at the end, comedy fails. So a lot of people are like, oh, comedy is risky sometimes. It is if you don't know little things that comedians know backwards and sideways. They're the true masters of public speaking. So I just wanted to show you these in operation. There are 12 different agencies that deal with exports. There are at least five different agencies that deal with housing policy. Then there's my favorite example. The Interior Department is in charge of salmon while they're in freshwater, but the Commerce Department handles them when they're in salt water. I hear it gets even more complicated once they're smoked.
Not exactly viral hilarity. <laughs> I think you will agree. But compared to Congress that day, that was pretty epic stuff. And when they surveyed people, they remembered two key words, and I'm pretty sure you know what they are. Two most memorable words, smoked and salmon. You have a very clear sequence there. Fresh water, salt water, smoked. But it, what happens if you put, put smoked first or second? If you put smoked first, what? He just becomes weird. <laughs> One of the like, most likable epic presidents ever literally just becomes a bit strange just by changing that sequence. It wouldn't be funny anymore. It would get no reaction. This one isn't viral hilarity. Free beer, topless bartenders, and false advertising. <laughs> right? And that was a bar in San Francisco, and they were male topless bartenders, and I was not expecting that. So, <laughs> so don't worry about that one in any way. But what happens if I move false advertising to position number one in that sign? So if it started off with false advertising, and then the other two, what happens? It's just weird. <laughs> not even Irish people are going into that bar. <laughs> That's how powerful knowing these tools are. It's the difference between something successful or not. I ended up writing a book about the, all this lunacy, and if you write a book, then you're like, oh, I need to get famous people to say nice things about my book, right? Publishers are always trying to get you to do that. It's a bit cringeworthy, but you have to try. So I got one there, two, number four. This book is great. I haven't read it yet, but David <laughs> drew a picture when he was six years old of a penguin drinking beer in a Chinese restaurant, and it was clear the potential for slight wisdom and misguided creativity were there. Marita Nihil, David's mother. <laughs> what happens if I put my mother in position number one there? <laughs> I'm a nutcase. Mothers would be proud. They're like, I should be number one. I made you. <laughs> Which is true. But I'll literally go into Barnes & Noble when I'm in New York and I'll go in, you know, bookstores are pretty quiet places and I'll watch someone pick up that book and they kind of read it and then they're like, ho, oh. <laughs> ho, and they have a little weird moment to themselves, and it's not like it's viral hilarity, but it's just a flip of expectations that they weren't expecting. And you can use this absolutely everywhere. It doesn't have to be the world of public speaking solely. PS section of an email works really well for a little one, two, four. I'll follow up, I'll do this, and then something that's totally different. So I'll email you next week, I'll give you a call, or I'll be standing out your side your door in the middle of the night. Just kidding, <laughs> bye bye now. Then you're going to be worried you get fired, don't blame me for that one. But it's just somewhere where you can play around a little bit. So if we had to sum this up, a lot of people will teach you public speaking. Have many of you taken a class before by show of hands in the world of public speaking somehow? And a lot, it kills me a little bit when I see them training it because they come in with their video camera and they're like, say three things into the camera. We'll record you, play it back. You'll see how bad you were. You're like, what the hell did you expect? You didn't give me any preparation time. You are here because I hate public speaking. Why would we do this to me? This doesn't, why would you do this to me? This doesn't make sense. How you deliver content is not the key part. Rubbish content delivered beautifully is still rubbish. So if I come in, I'm making eye contact and holding it and really freaking you out. Well done, look at this. He already wants to leave or I'm walking around and moving my hands like this graciously. You're not allowed to stand public speaking with your hands in your pockets. I've had them in my pockets for half this thing. It, it really makes no difference. And the people who emphasize that have never been on stage. 100%. You'll see comedians stand there the whole night sitting down on a stool sometimes, arms folded over, hands in their pockets, look at their feet. But the content is really strong. And if the content, the story, the thing you want to resonate is strong, how you deliver it, unless you're being a total weirdo by running around while you're doing it, isn't as important as you'd think. And a lot of that training to me, comedians would never do that. They'd never come in and go, let's start with delivery. They'd be like, what are you going to say? Like if you're on a Conan O'Brien show or you're on David Letterman, you have to send in your script. They don't care how you're going to practice it. You don't turn up and do the run through. Why would you do that? What are you going to say? That's what we care about. OK, go say it. People resonate with what you say, not how you say it. It's quite important. But how do we do this fast? So that's why a lot of this on the content. I'm going to give you a load of quick delivery tips in a minute. But honestly, the biggest difference is always in the content. And it's always in you getting personal about the content. You can have an amazing chart in there, pie chart. And people are like, oh god, that pie chart was amazing. Where do I get my hands on it? Like, that's not going to happen. They're like, oh, that chart you had, the way it went up, down, up again at the end. Didn't see that coming. Whew. How did you do it? Magic. Never. They're just, you said something about your mother that was amazing. You used to work here, so did I. We lived there, I lived there. That's what, oh, they never come up to you after and say anything else, really. So general topic, you can tell any story you ever want. Remember, as we said, I told you that story because. Start really wide, nobody cares about the specifics of your opinion first. 
like walk them into it a bit. Hey, we all have moments where, we all do two things where, being in a new place can be challenging. The idea is to capture as many people as possible. If you walk into a room and you're pitching something and you're a bit lawyerish in your approach, you're like, this is wrong and you need to change. We're argumentative boogers as people, like 50% of the room will naturally fold their arms and go, I don't agree. And you don't want that to happen. So very wide statements at the start and then kind of bring them down the funnel towards your way of seeing things. So identify five stories that you love telling and try and shoehorn them into any presentation ever. No matter how far off topic you think it is, put it in there. All the best ones I'm wor I've worked on ever, and I'm talking about with people who are speaking to 26, 27,000 people in a very high stakes tech environment where all the investors are there are using personal stories, and they're always the things that get tweeted about, and always the things to get the traction, and always the reason they get asked to speak somewhere else. So get those in there and use that joke structure we went through. And remember the details are important. You guys don't have a clue how to ask for a tax receipt, but you do know the Spanish word for to fit, which is. Caber. And you want to go for the tax receipt one? That could get controversial real fast. Don't do it. Being recorded, we'll all get in trouble. And then you just play around with the details because that's what allows you to have a little bit of fun. So that's the content creation side. I want to give you as many tips as I can on delivery as fast as I can. I just like that cat. That, that cat doesn't even need a build-up. Some images are just awesome all by themselves. So what makes the biggest difference to the fastest? So I believe these will give you the biggest results. I believe most people don't ever teach them or dwell on them. Number one most useful thing I ever learned was the memory palace. So it's a memorization technique popularized by Joshua Four in a book called Moonwalking with Einstein. The story's amazing if you don't know it. He was a New York Times journalist who went to the US Memory Championships, which is actually a sporting event where they compete on remembering things. Sounds like a lot of people's worst nightmare. And he's like, whoa, I don't have a great memory. I wonder if I went all 80-20 principle on this, went intensively into it a bit like AJ Jacobs, did it for a year, came back how good I'd be. He came back, became the US Memory Champion one year later. He became the 11th best mind in the whole world. The book is pretty epic. They're all using the same technique. So they take a, a memory palace like we already learned. They take something like Kaber, they create a story, and they put it somewhere. So this is my story. That night I was stood on stage, sweating out my shirt in front of 1,400 people at the mock. And this is a story about my mother coming over to San Francisco and having a pretty fun time and going home wearing Lululemon merchandise. <laughs> really changed her over there, got my war active. But all I'm doing while I'm on stage and talking is I'm walking around my house. It's very hard for your mind to go, what word is next? What do I say next? What do I say next? But if you go, where am I? That's very easy to answer. So I'm standing in the kitchen. There's a bear and a taxi driver in the kitchen. I need to talk about Caber. So you basically prepare your talk by making a bullet point list. A comedian would make a set list. And then you create a wild fictional story in your mind for every point. And then you go one step further. You put it in a physical location in the building you're most familiar with in life, often the house you live in or the place you grow up. And all you're doing when you're giving a talk is walking around clockwise or anti-clockwise. Must be sequential so you don't double back on yourself. And there's no limit. The only limit there is creativity. So I walk in the kitchen and a big elephant jumps out of the fridge. I need to talk about elephants. I walk into the bathroom and Lionel Messi runs out of the bathroom, dribbling a football. I need to talk about 10% GDP. That's the next thing I need to remember. He wears the number 10 on his back. So it's just whatever you associate with something, you use that. You never use the keyword itself. You picture the associated memory. And that's how these guys do large sequences of numbers. People who remember large volumes of numbers are usually turning the number into an animal. So they're like pig, goat, bear, whatever it may be. Something has to be associated with each thing that they can visualize. Sound like craziness? It's a big, a big old topic. Jump into it. I'll supply some links after this talk where you can read up on it some more. But if you use it, you can literally use this within five minutes. And you'll never be that person backstage who's standing looking at their notes. Ever see someone public speaking just about to go on or just outside a meeting room before they're coming into pitch and they're standing there looking at a piece of paper? How would you describe that person with a bit of paper just about before to give a presentation? Shaking Stevens, that was just me, thank you, and the hips, yes. Nervous? Anything else? Yeah, unprepared. Everything's negative. So if you're that person and you walk out with a bit of paper, everyone in the audience assumes you're not prepared already. So you need to find a way of doing this and hiding it. So a very good way is drawing this out hiding it on your person just for confidence reasons, or putting it on a stool, hiding it somewhere, putting a bottle of water in front of it. If anyone sees that, they haven't a clue what that little drawing means, as long as you don't pick it up and hold it. So a lot of the time, I'll have it on a stool next to me somewhere. I'll go over, take a moment, have a drink. Nobody else can see that I'm actually looking at the notes. And I'm not trying to read word for word, which is very obvious. I'm just trying to go, where am I in the house? Oh, yeah, we're in the bathroom. 
And then if my talk gets cut short, which happens a lot in the moment, I just skip a room. And I'm like, oh, that takes about a minute to explain if I go into the bathroom. Let me walk straight through. And if this talk has a structure and there's a couple of key learning points in it, how many key learning points do you think would be in it? Three, exactly. So a lot of people have 10 key things or five key things and people go away and they, they literally can't remember them. So if you have three key points, you're very easily able to keep a structure. That's the number one most useful thing I ever learned from comedians and it saved my life in public speaking I don't know how many times and anyone who's ever tried it is like, that's amazing. That helped me so much. So n people's normal biggest fear around public speaking is going blank on stage. This completely eliminates it. It also works really well for names. I'm sure nearly everyone in this room has a hard time remembering people's names. The minute you meet them, the minute they say their name, you need to create a visual representation of that name with somebody who you already know or somebody famous with that name. With this one, even if I asked you to picture your favorite restaurant, and you go, okay, I've got my favorite restaurant in my mind, where's the server when you greet? Is there somebody who greets you? Yeah, where are they? You can see them. How many tables are in that restaurant on the floor when you walk in? You'll be like, oh, 11 or 12. Very quickly, you can visualize it. Where's the bathroom? Oh yeah, I can see the bathroom. And you, you can do that with any building you've ever been in. Imagine if you're using it as the foundation for your talk and it's a house you live in that you know really, really well. So just try it, makes a big difference. Cut the fluff is huge. I just like farm animals, so I try and get one into most presentations for no apparent reason. There was a monster in New Zealand. You might have heard of him. He was roaming the glens wild and scaring people and freaking them out for years in New Zealand. And then they finally tracked him down, and he looked like this. <laughs> Shrek the sheep. He was a bit of a furry stallion of a sheep. And he was roaming wild for six years, and that's how he got that fluffy. And then New Zealand, they put him on live television, and they shared him for charity and he just became a fraction of the little sheep he used to be. Unfortunate news is this is your talk and this is any talk you've ever given or been subject to in corporate world whatsoever. And this is what it should be like. If you're lucky enough to ever write a book and work with an editor, that's what they're gonna do to your content. If you're lucky enough to ever give a TED talk, that's what they're gonna do with your content. That's great, it's an hour, oh no, no. We're gonna get you to do the nine minute version. So it's good to have a system where you edit yourself and the best way to do this is score the content from one to five. One is stuff that people don't really react to, they don't get excited about, they don't mention it afterwards. You don't think it's that key, but it kind of made it in there for some reason. Five is stuff that people applaud, they laugh, they love it, they tweet about it, they always ask you about it, and then anything in between on that range. And you want to end up with trees, fours, and fives, and just chop everything that's one and two, and just repeatedly do that until you get down to something that has three key points to it, and really you're like, oh, that's my best stuff. Did the rest need to be in here? It never needs to be in there. You think it does at the start, but when you trim it down and practice it, you're like, oh, I didn't need to have that in there. So do cut the fluff. Never ever speak from behind the podium. Very useful. Always just turn up with a clicker that you have yourself if you have to public speak because who, who speaks from behind the podium apart from some of your lovely colleagues? But if I was stood here like this for this whole talk, hello, who am I? Who normally speaks here from behind the podium? Priests, yeah, Obama. <laughs> Obama was amazing, but we have some politicians not quite fit into that mold. So usually politicians, priests, or university lecturers, those people you slept through for a lot of your life. But that's not a very engaging bunch that you want to be part of, but we have that assumption. Also, if you, if you don't see someone, you don't trust them. So TED Talks are always, like comedians are never hiding behind anything. A TED speaker is always just on a mat, and they have a clicker, and that's it. So very helpful for yourself just to get away from it and be able to walk around. Because if I was giving a talk now and you guys weren't listening, I can go for a walk. If Just say you happen to be on your phone. I can just stand here without saying anything to you, but just by being able to come over here, you'll usually stop. So it just gives you control over the room. But if you're stuck there, you don't have it. So you see a podium, get rid of it, get away from it. You're meant to be sitting down behind the table, jump up, let people see you, be quite visible, move around a little bit. Most people use filler words. Irish, word, Irish people definitely use filler words when they're speaking. I did a radio interview the other day, and the lady who went on after me was like, well, I suppose it's kind of, you know, it's one of those things. I mean, have you ever felt like it? I was like, wait a minute. That was like 11 words. You haven't said anything again. <laughs> and I do it all the time. And the way to change that as well, public speaking, is simply to raise your voice 20%. Right now, I'm speaking a little bit louder than normal. There's no audible change for you guys whatsoever. And it's impossible for me to say at an elevated tone the word, uh, it'll nearly blow your own brains out. You cannot do it. So just elevate your voice and that fixes that problem. No other training needed whatsoever. If someone tells you you speak too fast, you don't. Speak whatever is comfortable for you. The only time you need to slow down is the key points. 80% stand still. And then you can go back to doing all your weird stuff. 
but make your key points when you're standing there. Comedians de delivering a joke, they might be running around the stage, but when it's funny time, it's front and center, they step forward a bit, the voice comes up, you react, and then they might go for a walk again. But it's the only time if you're one of those people who's like, oh, I'm too slow, I speak too fast, too slow, you don't, just whatever is fine for you is fine for the audience. But for key points, to slow it down and raise your voice a little bit if you have this problem. First 30 seconds is the most important. If you're gonna memorize anything word for word, do the first 30 seconds because it's, if you're a nervous public speaker, if you hate public speaking like I do, you can say anything in the first 30 seconds. You have no control of what's going on over your body. So you're all sweating, things are going mad, you walk out, you get a bit flustered, and then you're just like, oh God. And you're standing there and you're like, hello, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, this, it was like I started off today. I was like, oh, people everywhere. Oh God, oh, hello, oh, thanks for having me. Oh, something about Justin Bieber. I don't know why I said that. Why didn't I memorize the first 30 seconds today? No, that's what was happening to me when I came out here today. Should have been doing it, but I didn't. Makes a big difference because you'll have been to a conference before and a speaker come out and does that. Like, hello, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so many of you here t today, it's great. I'm very honored. Um, uh, so many great people made this event possible and you're just like, kill me now, this is terrible. <laughs> Whereas someone comes out and they're like, I'm standing there and the tiger's staring right at me and you're like, ah, did he eat you? What happened there? Tell me more. Second, so a very good public speaker, storyteller, comedian, they start in the action, they use the present tense, and it's go from the word go. There's no fluff in there. They realize brevity is levity and every word counts. But just mad things can happen in that first 30 seconds. And try and stick to the time limit. We're going to do it today just in case anyone's running to watch the World Cup. Don't worry, we'll finish bang on time. There's a, these you can get with a little timer built into them and they'll vibrate. Um, so you know exactly what the time is doing. And I'm also cheating. This is a free app that I used that I let you see, and that's a countdown clock for me that I can see. But you didn't know I had until I ruined it right now. Okay, thanks. <laughs> but very handy, just so you know to shut up on time. Don't pet hamsters, more animals. Woohoo, happy days. Right, most people when they're nervous, they will do this with their hands. <laughs> like they're petting a little imaginary ball of fur that they're keeping very warm in there for some reason. And it's very easy to stop yourself doing that. I was looking for another bottle, but I don't have one. Practice at home with two glasses, one in each hand or a bottle in each hand, because this looks very natural to your audience. It's actually correlated to the virality or the view count on your talk, the more you move your hands, but it doesn't feel very natural to do. And when you're practicing with two things, one in each hand, every time you bang them together, you become very conscious of it. You're not gonna do that kind of hamster petting. That'd be really weird. Like, whoa, what's my iPhone doing to that bottle? Very unusual, don't do that. But you get the idea. So if you want to shortcut that learning process when you're practicing a glass in each hand, they clink, you know. But then you get very accustomed to speaking like that. Looks completely normal. Don't pet the hamsters. If something mad is going on, acknowledge it. Always acknowledge the obvious. Anyone training you, I hear this in business speaking so much and I'm like, oh, it's terrible advice. They're like, if you're having problems, just work through it. Ignore them. Like, don't ignore them. Everyone in the room can see something mental is happening. So you have to say it. Like if you're having a breakdown, if you make a joke that's horrendous, if you have a big stain on your shirt, they're just like, good God, can you not work your breakfast cereal? What happened to your clothes? What's going on here? You have to talk about it. I saw a guy once when he was, actually the fire alarm started going off and he's like, don't worry, I got 16 slides left. We'll get through them. <laughs> Look, the building's on fire, man. We're all out of here. But the easiest laugh you'll ever get ever is acknowledging the obvious thoughts of the audience towards something you're doing. If they're thinking it, you get marks for vocalizing it. If you're like me, when I live in America, I start talking, I can't assume that they know I'm Irish. They could be thinking anything. They're like, oh my God, is he Australian or Canadian or intoxicated? I just can't tell. <laughs> they don't know, so I have to say it, or they're just thinking, where's this guy from? So it's very important to spell that out. If you're conscious of the fact you might have an accent, you're a second language speaker, get it in in the opening statement in a way that isn't strange whatsoever. But just watch this. One of my favorite speakers ever, Dave Eggers, pet and hamster, acknowledging the other. Thank you uh, so much, uh, everyone from Ted and Chris and Amy in particular. I cannot believe uh, uh, I'm here. I have not slept in weeks. Uh, Neil and I were sitting there comparing how little we've slept uh, in anticipation for this. I've never been so nervous, uh, and I do this when I'm nervous, I just realized. Um, <laughs> Bang! Gets a laugh, moves on, one of the best talks you'll ever see. But if he didn't say that, it would be a bit weird, because you're like, what on earth is he doing? <laughs> He's like playing baseball with a hamster. He's like really going for it. Something great speakers will always do also, and you'll find in every leading talk, when they get a chance, they will add active. 
They will try and bring something to life for you by telling it in the present tense and changing their voice or their behavior just a little bit. So it's nearly something like an actor would do. And if a lot of people say, oh, I'm no good at voices, though, I can't do that. You just have to change your voice a little bit. You don't know what my mother sounds like. You don't know what my dad sounds like, right? I'm not, there's no racial connotations there. There's no risk factor. You're just illustrating that it's another person and that allows you to shorten the amount of words. So you don't say, and then she said, then I said, it's like, damn it. And then she says whatever the thing she's gonna say and we all move on quite happily. But just watch another, one of my favorite speakers, uh, four or five time New York Times bestselling writer, John Acuff. Really, really good, small difference, big impact. But we can't get a cat because my wife, Jenny, is allergic. And so McCray, our youngest daughter, scrunched up her face and thought and then said, we can get a cat when mom is dead. <sighs> Likeable? You like it? I love him as a speaker. And it's just all short personal stories all the time. He's an amazingly popular speaker. He told me he studies 100 comedians for every business speaker he does. So he's really trying to replicate their stuff, but amazingly likable. But do you see in that moment, he becomes the daughter. We can get a cat and pay, a sentence to the sen- pay attention to the sentence structure. Everything we've learned so far today. We can get a cat when mom is, still makes no sense. Mom is dead. Then it all makes sense. So if people are gonna laugh, he's facilitated that laughter. He can just stand there and soak it up. You're not stepping on your words. So if the end of laughter is followed by the height of listening, he knows that, they have time to react. If they don't, he just keeps going. But at no moment would you know he was trying to be funny. But of course he is. That's a story he's told before. He knows they're gonna laugh. This will save your life if you're pitching, presenting in any way, or public speaking ever. Never finish on a Q and A. Don't do it. That's like presenting suicide. That would be the equivalent of you two going on a tour around the world, writing a new album, going to Madison Square Garden, bringing the energy through the roof. It's 10 songs. They've already played nine. They've got one left. Bring it home or just ask the audience, hey, anyone here play an instrument? (laughs) Maybe you want to bring it home, finish us off here? They'd never do that, right? Like they've created, that's all their work. That's everything they've said. They get to bring it to an end and leave the strongest possible impression or just give it to random chance and say, anyone want to share it? And you know, when you ask a question, it's always a life story. Well, like in my company, it's like, I call Brian and he's like, not really nice. And then there's a thing about this and I feel emotionally in a way. And you're like, that's, what's that? That's not a question. <laughs> Have you ever seen that happen at a conference where it just goes on and on and on? If you say these words, it will save your life. I'm going to take a few questions before I make my conclusion because that tells him a couple of things. I'm gonna talk some more. There is a conclusion left. And that way, when someone goes to ask you what those really long-winded stories, the other people in the room will dead stare at him going, shut up, shut up. (laughs) And you can see the eyes, we're never gonna get out of here. He said he has a conclusion to come. We're not finished, I need to go home. And you literally feel it. So they'll do partly your job for you. But then if there's that awkward moment, have you ever seen a speaker standing there and someone's like, any questions for the speaker? And they're just like, oh God, please, somebody ask me something. And then the presenter will be like, someone back there. And they're like, no, it wasn't me. <laughs> and then I just have to walk off like this. Okay, goodbye now. And nobody even knows it's over. Like it's total madness, but it happens all the time. So if I say, I'm gonna take a few questions before I make a conclusion and nobody asks any questions, no big deal. I know I have another slide. And how many things are gonna be on that slide? Either one or three. Two of the most memorable combinations you can ever have, one or three. So you want to, if you take nothing away from this talk today, here's one thing. If you take nothing away from this talk, here's three things. But it doesn't end in a way that they control it. So if you're presenting and you want them to switch over to this product or service or take action, listen, I've said a lot here today, but ultimately it comes down to these things and then off you go. They applaud, say thank you. When you say thank you, everyone knows it's over and then it's fine. Makes the world a better place. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, more exciting. Review and evaluate, you're not gonna want to listen to yourself back. You're like, oh God, I hate listening to myself. I hate listening to myself, everybody does. Comedians will do a comedy club, do their set, audio record it on their smartphone, listen back to it instantly and adjust. So they're constantly editing themselves. You won't wanna do it. And if you're like, David, I'm never gonna do that ever. Audio record it, put it through a service like Trint, which is a transcription service. It's really, really cheap to use and, and really good. There's a number of them, but that's the best one that I've found to use and then just turn it into a script and go, oh, there are my words. I better edit this script. And now all of a sudden you're actually preparing your talk for the next time without having to watch yourself, but becoming quite conscious of the amount of mad things that you've said. See, but you'll see patterns. You're like, oh, I said, but I said, I'm excited 57 times. Like a guy I was working with the other day, I was like, I don't think they believe you're excited after the 56th time there that you said, I'm excited. 
So with that, I'd, I'd like to take a, a few questions before I make my conclusion. <laughs> So listen, I'm, not, I'm hanging around after if you want to ask me any questions, but I didn't want to leave you hanging. I love this sign. Rows are red, bacon is red, poems are hard, bacon. <laughs> it's completely rubbish. And it tries to illustrate everything we talked about today, and it's brilliant in its rubbishness because it acknowledges the obvious failure of what they were trying to do. <laughs> so even if you're trying to be funny and you go, oh my god, that did not work, did it? They'll be like, no, it didn't. And then they all laugh. It's always totally fine as long as you acknowledge how bad it's going. If you're up there and you're thinking it's amazing and you're doing all this stuff with your hands and you're making the eye contact and you're making your big points and they're sitting there going, what a weirdo, what are you doing? <laughs> so just always, always, always acknowledge the obvious and have a bit of fun with this. People are so supportive to see you doing well in public speaking. Like, have you ever seen someone do terribly and you're just watching them and you're like, oh my God, I hope that the ground just magically opens up and a tunnel <laughs> appears that they can slide through and it brings them back to a fireplace and their slippers with a mug of tea just going, thank God that's over. Like, you really want that to happen. And I can tell you that all day, how supportive people are of you public speaking, but this is the best example I've ever found in my whole life of just how long they will wait for you to speak, how long will they will support you, and how long they'll literally, how literally, as a nervous speaker, you think silence, you have to fill it all the time. This is the opposite example in its ultimate form. So I hope you like it. This is how bad I was at sex the first time. The first time I ever had sex. Yesterday. <laughs> Legend of a man. <laughs> so that was a full 29 seconds. And the best example I've ever found, the end of laughter is followed by height of listening. They estimate the people on average watching this or in this room laugh about 15 times a day. And as kids, we used to laugh about 300 times. So anyone who brings a little bit of that back to corporate life, you tend to stand out and actually get rewarded for it. You'll get asked to speak more and more often on behalf of your company. So there's no, there's no downside to doing any of this. That's the link I promised I'd tell you where you can get more of this info and if you want to get in touch with me. Um, all the tips you can get that I've mentioned today in the back of that book for free. You don't even have to buy it if you don't want to. Uh, and I'll put that up again at the end if you want to get it. I don't want to leave you hanging. Remember me on stage telling a story that I was like, loads of crazy things happen in the moth. The mod, by the way, I should tell you that they score people after their story. So like the Olympics, after you've gone, that sounds like my worst nightmare. Like some stranger is going to hand up a number judging you. Imagine you lost your virginity and strangers were hiding at the end of your bed and just popped up and went, two! In my mind, that it was, oh, uh, I know, sounds very, that's happened to you? I didn't think that was a thing. I thought, no, okay. So I'm on stage, right? And I would uh, self-published a version of my book. And now I'd sold it to a publisher and they said, you need to rewrite the ending. So I was like, maybe if I win this competition, that'd be a good ending. And there was three comedians in this competition. And of course, my theory is comedians are the world's true master of public speaking. They're going to be one, two, three for sure. So it's down to one speaker left to go, one storyteller. And the comedians are number one, number two, and number three. I'm winning. And there's one le well, lady left to go. My friends are in the audience, my, including my friend Arish with the spinal cord injury. They found the name Irish Dave somewhere, and they put two and two together. And they're like, that's you. You never told us. And they all came. And I was like, oh, God, no. So this lady went last, and she beat me by like point something. And I was like, oh, no. There goes the end of the book. That screwed all my theories around this topic completely. Uh, she, was, she was amazing. And I started talking to her. I was like, how'd you do it? Like, you don't have any background in comedy, right? She's like, I read everything I could get my hands on. Loads of useful stuff. And I was like, tell me, tell me, tell me, because I'm about to publish a book. I want to know. And she's like, well, this one was really useful. Pulled up all these cliff notes. Seven Comedy Habits to Be a Better Speaker by David Nile. <laughs> <laughs> Chances. I was like, you beat me with my own book. Oh. <laughs> I was like, right, that's the end of this story now. I have no ending. And then this, actually, this guy saw it and asked me to come do a TED Talk. And I was like, no, that'd be a good ending. And I was like, hold on, actually, I have a friend called Arash, and his story is better than anything I could ever come up with. Hugely inspirational. Can I send you a clip of him in action? His first talk ever. I think you'll love it. I sent it to him. And he booked him in my place. And Arash got a 51-second standing ovation as he told everyone how he trained for one whole year to do something doctors would say never do again. 
and stand on his own two feet because he wanted to propose to his girlfriend eye to eye instead of doing it from his wheelchair. So of course she said yes. He stood up out of his wheelchair on stage and she came out and joined him and the audience lost their mind. And the hairs on the back of my neck even stand up just telling you guys about it. So if you take nothing else from this talk, start with a story and really find the key point of it, the fun part or the funny part. Use those comedian's techniques because at the end of the day it's your story. You know it better than anyone else and you never know what will happen when you tell it. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.